Uh, welcome everyone. This is session. This is session seven. It's a tongue twister. Uh, session seven of the Climate Crosswords Summit, um, and the title of this session is "The Need of Science for Consistency in the International and National Climate Policy Processes." We're going to be holding a panel um uh in this session with four speakers um rania will be the timekeeper then i'm going to ask some questions of the panelists we have some wonderful panelists from yasa and the world bank and uh then sophia who i believe is in the room will help with questions and comments from the room in person and uh, then we'll be looking uh, here also on the Zoom for any questions and comments um, uh, from um, the um, folks who are um, who are joining um, uh, virtually. So turning now to the topic of the session, there's growing urgency for climate action for two reasons. One is the lack of achievement of the Paris Agreement goal of holding planetary warming to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures. And the second is reason for the urgency is the simultaneous worldwide experience of increasing climate extremes. Therefore, the urgency for this session is ever growing. It will consider the science policy linkages for both mitigation and adaptation, because those are the dual challenges. The need for accelerating reduction in greenhouse gas emissions at the same time as preparing for higher levels of warming is now the dual challenge for both global and national policymakers. YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, has played a fundamental role in providing future socioeconomic scenarios that have been used by scientists, researchers, and policymakers to devise evidence-based climate action programs. The World Bank, the other uh, lead organizer of this session, marshals massive investments to end poverty and boost shared prosperity under these dual challenges so that they so we can all together both scientists and policymakers ensure a livable planet for all speakers on this panel will share lessons learned from their vast experience in developing and providing these essential science policy linkages and provide guideposts for the way forward I turn now to the first speaker. I'm going to uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers uh, as they come up. I'm not going to um, do them all now. I'm going to in introduce them one by one. Our first speaker is Kwan Riahi, who is program director of the Energy, Climate, and Environment Research Program at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Kwan is going to be sharing with us today. The top hit, the title of his talk is Transformation Pathways for Supporting Climate Policy. Over to you, Kiwan, and you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, for uh, the, the kind introduction. It's really a, a pleasure to be here today. Um, let me uh, perhaps uh, share my slides with you. I hope you can see them now. Yeah, so that so that so the topic of my uh, presentation is that as Cynthia just said, uh, transformation pathways for supporting climate policies. Um, before perhaps going there, let me um, say a few words about our research institution, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. So we are we are an international research organization uh, in Austria with 20 different national and regional uh, member organizations. Uh, the US is part um, of, um, of EASA and perhaps even the most uh, 
uh, important uh, member. Uh, we have been found in the 1970s as to build a bridge to systems analysis uh, between East and West. I think that topic is um, also nowadays extremely important. And if you, if, you, if you look at the different member countries of IASA, uh, there's uh, the US sitting together with China, uh, with India, with Russia, uh, but also um, uh, the Ukraine around the table. We are not a political organization and research organization and try to do uh, science together. We are 530, roughly around 530 researchers from um, more countries than our member organizations, more than 50 countries. Um, and the work, it, the work itself uh, is basically the research areas uh, are focus on um, trying to understand major global challenges and solutions to those challenges. I'm uh, the um, director of uh, energy and environment and um, a climate program, but we do also research in other areas like population and behavior, biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, the economy. We have a, um, a quite big program also on the social science aspects like governance and institutional change, et cetera. And many of our uh, research outcomes feed directly into different policy uh, processes. So for us, it's important, and that's the applied in our name that uh, the research is also used and is, is helping basically decision makers at different levels, at the international level, national level, but also at the uh, sub-national level. Um, if you think about uh, the contribution, I would say, of, um, of scenarios and perhaps uh, of perhaps um, there's this bar in the middle of my, sorry. Um, so if you think, if you think about uh, the contribution of um, particularly transformation pathways and uh, socioeconomic scenarios uh, to um, our understanding of climate, I would say there are uh, various different, um, um, it's, it's, uh, there, there have been various different contributions um, uh, that have been critical for the international policy process. Um, scenarios at the global scale have helped us to understand um, uh, the pace at which you would need to transform the system and the contribution of different uh, mitigation measures in order to uh, stabilize the climate, which in turn means that we need to reduce um, anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions to zero and, and reduce non-CO2 emissions as, as much as possible. From, from, from the scenario work, we also understand that uh, it will be very difficult to reduce emissions in some of the hard to abate sectors. So achieving net zero uh, CO2 emissions doesn't, need, doesn't mean that every activity on this planet needs to be net zero. We need to reduce emissions as much as possible and, and need to offset uh, those emissions that remain to uh, negative emissions um, uh, in other sectors, particularly by increasing the biospheric sink of the planet or by um, uh, um, in basically looking into technical options of how to reduce the CO2. And a lot of these activities have been happening in a collaborative way in the uh, in the community and, and um, have fed into uh, um, important uh, global assessments, uh, particularly the IPCC assessment, uh, which is taking place regularly every uh, seven years and which summarizes the state of the climate. And, uh, the, and um, uh, the, the role of the IPCC is extremely important uh, because it's a, an international transparent way to assess the information. Uh, and uh, to that has also uh, legitimacy and uh, trust from the international um, the negotiations and uh, to that has been also quite instrumental in influencing uh, the policy, de policy decisions and targets and also mechanisms in order to reduce uh, emissions and the Paris Agreement, I would say, is a, is a result of that as well. Uh, so the IPCC feeds into the, into, the, into the international negotiations. And if you look at, for example, the the most recent conference of parties, COP28, which uh, took uh, place in the uh, Arab Emirates, you can see that many of the outcomes, um, uh, the suggestion to triple um, renewable energy, doubling of energy efficiency, 
um, accelerating the use of carbon capture in hard to abate sectors, the schedule for met methane reductions, all of those can be rooted back more or less directly into the scenario analysis and the scientific work, uh, which is uh, summarized in the, in the IPCC assessments. Um, yeah, we can use our uh, models not only to inform uh, the, the policy process, we can also use uh, systems analysis to understand uh, whether the um, pledges by different countries actually also really add up uh, to the um, targets, for example, of the Paris Agreement, namely to limit warming to below, uh, uh, to well below two degrees and to even approach one and a half degrees. And uh, this is one of the recent studies uh, um, uh, which uh, shows you basically on the top uh, left corner, you can see uh, historical emissions, uh, uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and then uh, for the year 2030, uh, this um, bluish area here uh, shows you basically the future development of uh, greenhouse gas emissions under current policies. So if you take current policies and as they are implemented in different countries, you can see uh, that we have a relatively flat development. And this is already a major progress compared to 10 years ago where most of these uh, lines were uh, headed upwards. So the Paris Agreement has led to uh, uh, quite some policy signal in many of the different countries and has slowed down emissions. No. But um, if you, um, um, you can compare uh, what is actually legislated, what is um, in terms of climate policy to what different countries have pledged now, um, either for the year 2030, where the target of the Paris Agreement is also, or also um, what countries have also made promises in terms of net zero targets. And if you put all of that in our, in our models, you can see that um, the ambition of the countries is to reduce emissions actually quite uh, more strongly, and um, that, in, and if you look at the temperature outcomes of those two different types of scenarios, you can see that current uh, policies would lead to temperature change or warming uh, compared to pre-industrial of something between two and a half and three degrees with a quite with a quite some uncertainty. And if we then add all the other pledges which are there, um, actually we would um, um, be significantly under two degrees, even approaching one and a half degree. The problem is that if you look into um, the credibility of some of the country pledges, only, only for a few of them really plans exist and targets exist uh, and that would translate into uh, future policies. And if we um, assess now high, relatively high confidence uh, to lower confidence pledges, uh, we can see that uh, by the ambition of many of the countries is there to get to net zero emissions, um, the, in, the implementation of the policies lags behind the ambition and we need to try to um, 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 uh, introduce more uh, policies on the ground in order to make the ambition consistent with the implementation. Um, another, another perhaps important point that I wanted to make is uh, that um, uh, many of the scenarios can be, can be used in order to identify important area of uh, technology innovation that is needed in order to achieve net zero um, emissions. And one of the major areas is uh, to look into new options for energy storage. Uh, storing energy given the variability of uh, renewables. And at our institute, we have been looking beyond the typical um, technologies that are suggested in this area, like pumped hydro or batteries. We think that this is an enormously underexplored area and that in many different infrastructures that we have, but also new innovations, we can effectively store energy and uh, help this transformation towards a renewable system. Perhaps the most promising ones are um, the beyond energy storage um, facilities where for countries who don't have um, mountains where you can uh, basically use pumped hydro as a storage energy storage facility, you can push masses underwater and have underwater beyond the uh, storage facilities, but also um, um, storage in a deep ocean with compressed air and hydrogen 
uh, look very promising. Uh, why do I mention this? Because of uh, particularly one technology that we have suggested, which was underground gravity energy storage, basically transforming coal mines into uh, batteries in the future. This is actually an option which is uh, relatively expensive to some of the other uh, technologies that we have explored as well, uh, but it got picked up by many, many different uh, um, institutions and also uh, a number of startups have been uh, generated, uh, has been created um, uh, following uh, that publication and also the country of Romania, for example, has now the plan to transform 17 coal mines into gravity energy storage systems. And the reason for that is uh, that um, one to uh, this type of uh, to this type of technology, uh, we find solutions that help the incumbent industries uh, to um, be part of the transition, rather than creating losers and regions which rely on fossil fuels. Uh, we can to this type of uh, synergistic uh, technology innovations um, um, uh, pull the industry uh, with us in this important uh, transformation. Another important area, I think, in terms of technology innovation will be to try to understand how we can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, we see that we will overshoot uh, the Paris uh, target of one and a half degree already now. And once we have overshoot that, overshot that target, it will be important to uh, think about solutions, how we can take CO2 again out of the atmosphere. Uh, the natural thing, um, uh, growing forests is perhaps the best option. Um, in this area, uh, but the, the natural um, sink of the planet is slowing down, is also affected by climate change. So increasingly, we need to think also about uh, technological solutions in this area. And there are many, many different uh, innovations possible from using bioenergy, this carbon capture uh, to different um, um, uh, other 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 types, or perhaps even taking the CO two directly out of the atmosphere, which is called direct air uh, capture. We need to we need to explore the sustainability of these options and also their acceptability, um, and that's why we conduct empirical work surveys, but also uh, do uh, modeling of these and explore the uh, interaction of these systems with the rest of the um, uh, re rest of the system. Um, let me uh, perhaps also comment a little bit on um, the policy, um, uh, the, policy, the policies in the European Union. Um, many of the climate targets in the European Union, for example, are underpinned by uh, scientific assessments uh, that try to not only understand the feasibility of the transformation, but also include fairness considerations. Um, I'm uh, personally part of the EU advisory board on climate change, which is part of the European climate law. And um, we were charged with uh, suggesting emissions reduction targets for the European Union for the year 2040 and uh, the budget that Europe uh, should, uh, the carbon budget, the CO2 budget that uh, Europe um, uh, should um, uh, basically, um, the CO2 budget within which we should stay in within Europe. And um, uh, the suggestion uh, by the advisory board was to reduce 90%, 90 to 95% emissions by 2040. That's much more stringent than, for example, trying to linearly go down uh, to 2050. So the European target is to be climate neutral in 2050. And the reason for this was to try to limit cumulative emissions in Europe, given the historical responsibility that we have and capacity. And uh, increasingly, the discussion also from an international fairness perspective to think about not only uh, to take forceful uh, targets on board, but also uh, to, to think about how Europe can support other countries in the transformation, which have lower historical responsibility on the current climate That's change. the one minute warning. Perfect. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I'm already perhaps a little bit over, over time. So, so let me have two slides and I can go to them very quickly. Um, the um, IPCC, uh, very often the discussion is about, we see that uh, from the modeling, we understand very well that uh, technological, whether whether the scenarios are feasible in terms of technology and also in terms of the economics of the solution. And um, I've just wanted to um, point out that recently there are many 
um, um, assessments of the feasibility of the transformation from very different dimensions. Um, and um, um, for example, whether from a geophysical, economic, technological, social, cultural, but also institutional or governance perspective, the pathways that we see in the IPCC report that has been published, published just recently, um, actually two years ago in the meantime, uh, whether those are feasible or not. And if you look at that assessment, the major conclusion of the feasibility assessment is actually that um, the lack of governance capacity and adequate institutions in particularly some of the developing countries where a lot of mitigation would happen because that's where the future demand is, uh, is going to be, um, has been a big, a big challenge. Uh, therefore, just recently there has been a, um, um, an intermodeling comparison uh, looking to, to, to basically including governance constraints into the integrated assessment models, which is uh, a quite new um, area of research. So bringing social sciences together with the natural science and the engineering science and the um, economics of it. And um, the main conclusion of this study is that um, if we just look at cost-effective mitigation, um, uh, it is feasible to be in this safe corridor between well below two degree and one and a half degrees. If you though add those governance concerns, um, the uh, different um, integrated assessment models um, uh, show that there's an increase in the cumulative emissions, the feasibility frontier moves, and um, is getting even uh, above the two degree uh, target. Um, and therefore, we looked into um, what are the conditions um, that we can deal with those uh, governance uh, concerns, because it will take some time until governance can improve. And uh, the main conclusion here was that disruptive end use um, innovations uh, that uh, can deal I can limit energy demand and at the same time also improve the quality of the services uh, could bring us back into this uh, safe corridor uh, between two and, and one and a half degrees. And my colleague Shonali Pachawi will actually focus more on those disruptive end use innovations. So you will hear more about this. Thank you and sorry for running a little bit over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiwan, uh, for um, really sharing the uh, great contributions of the YASA scenarios to the IPCC, to the COP process. Um, the uh, also how the, how these uh, how the work of YASA, for example, can be used in regard to innovation. I love the coal mines uh, storing um, the uh, gravity-based energy. And then finally, your like your some of the key points, right? A key point right at the end about the readiness of governance and institution for the transformation, and how the scenarios and how the work of Yasa really can contribute to that, bringing out this absolutely critical part, which is uh, very much the um, uh, the focus of of this session. Um, and I believe a lot um, of the uh, Climate Crossroads Summit um, as well. Let's turn now to our second speaker, who is Jia Li. She is, and I believe she's in the room, uh, which is great. So we're going back and forth, uh, a hybrid panel. Um, Jia Li is a senior economist with the Climate Change Group at the World Bank. And her topic today is the country climate and development report process using scenarios to inform a country low carbon and resilient development. Remember in the beginning, we we're talking about both mitigation and adaptation, bringing, bringing the two together. So Gia, over to you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Cynthia. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I used to come to the National Academies when I was working in the US government more, uh, so it's nice to be back. Uh, so maybe just a, a couple of words about the World Bank. Uh, so World Bank is an international finance institution. It's uh, the largest uh, financier of climate uh, climate actions and, and climate investment in particularly developing countries, the low-income, middle-income countries. Um, so Cynthia already mentioned our vision around poverty reduction, shared prosperity, which is also evolving. So our current vision statement uh, with the new president is the, a world free of poverty on the livable planet. So this is actually a big deal for us. The first time planet actually is in the uh, very top line aspiration for our operations and uh, all the activities. I think it's recognizing 
the really interconnected um, uh, dimensions of development, vulnerability, and uh, uh, climate change. So a lot of our work is really trying to understand this nexus and uh, knowing many countries um, in the de developing world face different uh, vulnerabilities, particularly the low income countries. They have very low emissions, but they, they face very high disproportionate uh, impacts from extreme events and climate impacts. So how do we think about development in the context, uh, both in terms of emissions and also climate impacts? Um, so today I would just uh, use, let's see. Oh, yes, you see that. Um, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about this new uh, core diagnostic uh, that the bank has been uh, doing for all the countries called the Country Climate Development Report. As the name suggests, it is really an exploration of the interconnections and the relationship between development and climate change, both on climate change impacts to countries and how the policies around mitigation ad adaptation would um, intertwine um, and interact with development goals. So um, so I, I also want to just uh, second what Cynthia said about the YASA's contribution in this science space uh, of developing you know, scenarios and this understanding of so future social economic trajectories and looking at climate uh, systems. And uh, we have been using the scenarios for our work as well in this particular case with the CCDRs. Um, so we also explore a set of scenarios starting from the IPCC and also looking at the policy scenarios, um, understanding there's a lot of uncertainty around the social economic development and also uncertainty around climate impacts as well. So what does it mean for the countries we work? Um, so we take those international global scenarios and use that as a framing um, to guide all the work we're doing at the country level. Um, so we use the consistent scenarios to all the work, both at the national level, looking at the macroeconomic impacts of climate change, and also at the sectoral level, um, could be agriculture, water, um, energy systems. But we also look at you know, the, the set of uh, scenarios for decarbonization and resilience, ad adaptation of resilience. So here, what I want to highlight our work is, you know, we do look at the global narrative around you know, these scenarios and pathways, but we we're really using the country's development um, goals or development aspiration as a starting point. So understanding countries have um, the needs and um, uh, to develop, and they have, you know, in different dimensions, the need to meet the, the basic human well-being goals and the sustainable development goals, and also economic development. So we take that. We also look at countries' aspirations on climate. You know, so. We'll, countries' NDCs and long-term strategies, national adaptation plans, using that to guide the analysis while exploring different ways to meet the development goals and, and aspirations. The, what is the implication on emissions and um, what are some of the interacting factors, you know, like both in terms of the economic development, social development, and also political economy, feasibility, distributional impact, and uh, lastly, because we are also a finance institution, so uh, finance investment is very important. So we want to also know what are the investment costs and needs and who would pay for that. So it is an integrated way that we look at countries' um, development and climate trajectory. So um, I would just uh, very quickly show a few summary slides of the work. So right now, this work is covering over 50 countries, and we are um, still, in, you know, expanding uh, the ideas to, you know, have this CCDR done for all the countries that we work with, and use that as a guidance um, for our engagement, both the policy engagement, uh, policy reform, and investment, uh, and and some of the technical assistance. So one of the uh, high level messages, very clear from the set of analysis we have done using, you know, this global to national. Uh, type of scenarios, you can actually do some comparison across countries too, at different stage of development in different regions, facing different vulnerabilities, climate impacts, maybe having different energy mix and uh, availability, um, that it is very clear, you know, the lower income countries are more vulnerable. Um, this is, you know, in IPCC, and this is confirming based on the data we're using from the country level. 
Um, we also look at not just the economic or macroeconomic GDP impact, but we also look at other well-being indicators. And um, you know, the story is very consistent around po poverty, gender inequality, you know, food insecurity, and other impacts uh, such as human health and um, you know, uh, labor productivity uh, outcomes. This is your one minute warning. Oh, great. So we also explore the low uh, emission development pathways. So again, here we look at countries' current trajectory on their development um, trajectory as baseline, and also their climate commitment in the NDC. In some cases, we're able to see, well, you know, if we need to achieve 1.5 degree, all countries need to achieve net zero by, you know, mid-century. So how does that look like? What are the feasibilities and costs? And you do see this wide range of um, pathways where a country needs to go uh, from where they are today. Uh, but overall, we, we do find you know, feasib feasible pathways um, in different countries. So in terms of investment needs, we're also seeing, you know, we're able to look at the investment for both for mitigation and also for uh, resi increasing resilience. Um, the investment needs are higher in lower income countries as percentage of their uh, GDP and uh, income. And these are the countries oftentimes have more limited uh, ability and uh, weaker institution um, and, uh, you know, both to invest and also absorb finance. Um, so the last slide I want to show, this is a complement to what uh, Kieran just said earlier around uh, institution. So we have also done work on the adaptation resilience space is a little bit uh, different because we don't have a 1.5 degree target to uh, use as a gold post. Um, so in the Paris alignment, uh, sorry, Paris agreement, there's also a global goal on adaptation, which is very broad on reducing uh, vulnerability, increasing resilience, enhanced uh, adaptive capacity, but that's multidimensional. So we also look at, um, you know, Basically, this is a scorecard we're looking using a consistent methodology, both quantitative and qualitative, to look at countries' uh, institutional readiness, uh, which is helping us to really identify what are some of the key areas country needs to uh, address on the policy development and what we could do. Um, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gia. Um, you really brought forward through the um, through the use of the uh, country climate and development reports um, that the that the uh, bank is developing, several aspects of scenarios that are so important. One is the consistency, um, so that you can actually create those kinds of um, analyses to really understand uh, the vulnerability, for example, in the low income countries. But at the same time, you also mentioned another great aspect of scenarios, which is the addressing the uncertainties in both the climate and also the socioeconomic conditions and pathways going forward. Um, and echoing again, as you said, K1, in regard to um, help, how helpful they are in regard to identifying um, uh, investments um, and investment programs, investment pathways, and then very much also, which is becoming very much a theme of this session, I think, the institutional, the need for institutional readiness and how, again, this consistency of approach can really help in developing um, and furthering those, those that policy development. So thank you very much. Let's turn to our third speaker. We're going back to Yasa now, Shanali Pachari. Uh, she is the leader of the Transformative Institutional and Social Solutions Research Group that's within the Energy, Climate, and Environment Research Program at YASA. And uh, Shanali is going to be uh, sharing uh, with us today her topic on achieving net zero by lowering demand and social innovations. So over to you, Shanali. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Uh, yeah, and thanks to the National Academies for having this session and uh, giving us this opportunity to share some of our research. Um, so, um, yeah, just as that's coming up, uh, I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, pathways and options for achieving net zero. And traditionally, the focus has very much been on transforming 
supply systems, right? So transforming the energy system, transforming buildings and transport and so on. But it's very much been a focus on the supply side. Uh, and so a lot of the conventional scenarios that we look at are really looking at um, changing um, energy systems, making them uh, renewable, uh, low carbon, and so on. But we know that there's an inertia in policy and in the technology change uh, uh, arena. And we're also very, it's very evident now that actually we are quite likely to overshoot the one and a half degree target that we've uh, uh, set for ourselves globally, uh, which means that there will be a need for negative emissions as Kevan also pointed out in his talk. Um, but another set of scenarios that one might explore is really those that focus on the demand side. And this hasn't been done enough. And that's something that we've really been trying to focus on also in our research at EASA. And uh, there are huge advantages of looking at transformation on the demand side because it reduces the size of the system. So it's easier to then uh, decarbonize it. Uh, and it also has a lot of um, co-benefits for health and well-being, uh, which is, of course, uh, something that's important to everyone and everywhere. Um, and, and finally, you know, we have to rely less on negative emissions technologies, which have been uh, quite controversial uh, in many parts of the world. Um, so we've been trying to look at um, basically a whole range of um, digital Digital, digital technology enabled innovations that are happening both on the technology level, but also on the social uh, innovation side. Uh, and these are really um, innovations that are taking advantage of digital technologies, of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, innovations, of uh, sharing uh, uh, and so social innovations that really are allowing for changing the way um, we live uh, in terms of less ownership, more sharing, more service-based economy, more sharing-based economy, uh, and, and basically uh, allowing for more um, of consumer independence at and autonomy over how they um, receive the goods and services and use the goods and services that provide them with well-being. Um, and so this has been part of uh, work that's been going on on really trying to look at the potential of these kinds of social and disruptive end user innovations in then addressing the whole climate mitigation challenge that uh, uh, we, we are faced with today. Um, even within the IPCC, uh, the AR6 report, the sixth assessment report, was for the first time really focusing significantly on looking at the potential of demand side mitigation. And um, it, it really, uh, for the first time, tried to quantify how much this potential is. And we see that there are options across all sectors, basically, to mitigate uh, through demand side action. And we often think of demand side as being only individuals, but actually this really requires uh, change in infrastructure use and technology adoption, um, and basically social innovation, as I've mentioned before. Uh, and the potential is 40 to 70% globally, according to the assessment, which is humongous. Um, I, I, I will mention two examples of um, work that we've been doing uh, within EASA that's trying to, again, quantify some of this potential on the demand side. Uh, one is really at the global level. So uh, the two examples are at different levels of uh, analysis. At the global level, we've been trying to look at how big is the potential to reduce emissions from the building sector, from the residential uh, building sector. And uh, basically we looked at um, a bunch of different scenarios that look at changing activity uh, levels. So for example, having slightly smaller average space per capita in terms of living area um, and uh, having um, a lower set point temperature for heating and cooling, for example. Uh, then we've also looked at a whole bunch of scenarios that look at electrification of the building sector and uh, fuel switches. So of course, electrification brings a whole bunch of 
efficiency improvements. Uh, we've also looked at other technology and energy efficient options, really for retrofitting and um, uh, getting to sort of passive building standards in different parts of the world. And uh, then, of course, the combination of all of these policies together. And actually, when we do look at these whole bunch of policies that really allow for avoiding or shifting to better efficient technologies um, or improving uh, efficiency uh, of existing goods and services, we see that uh, there's a whole range of options and these policies combined together can reduce uh, energy in the building sector by about 60%. Um, That's the one minute warning. Right, thanks so much. Uh, and then if you look at it in terms of CO2 reduction potential, again, um, we see that combining these demand side policies with the traditional supply side decarbonization that's uh, looked at within the one and a half degrees scenarios, uh, really looks at potentially reducing emissions from the building sector by almost 96%. So that, that's a huge, huge potential. And the, that these supp supply side and demand side policies are really very complementary in many senses. Um, at a different scale, um, okay, uh, maybe, maybe the last slide that I have, maybe you could help move me along on it. Um, so at a, at a different scale, we've also been looking at agent-based models uh, at the national level and the subnational level. And the advantage of these agent-based models is that they really capture behavioral diversity of a bunch of different consumers and, and also allow one to explore cross-sectoral um, um, opportunities. So for example, uh, how one could change, uh, the co could change configurations of cities so that people work and live and commute in smaller uh, conf confines and then therefore can reduce uh, emissions based on that. So um, next, sli next slide, please. Um, basically in this uh, particular example that I um, uh, tried to illustrate here is a study from the Netherlands where again, uh, through this agent-based modeling, we've tried to look at how behavioral changes, how social norms and uh, um, the diffusion of more pro-environmental social norms, what the potential of that is for emissions reduction. And again, uh, the point that I want to kind of make with this slide is that using these kinds of um, demand side and social innovation, uh, behavioral change options, along with the traditional supply side carbon pricing type interventions, really can bring us to a much lower level of emissions at in a much faster uh, time span than uh, conventional solely supply side based opportunities. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll stop with that and I'll, uh, I look forward to the rest of the uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shanali. Um, you offered us hope, I think, uh, by um, uh, uh, encouraging um, everyone, I would say, to um, look at de the demand side as well as the supply side, um, and that there can be tremendous co-benefits to health, for example, um, by decreasing the size of some of our um, energy systems as they are as they are developed now. Um, this the, uh, one of the buzzwords right now, of course, is disruption. These um, the uh, these demand side uh, interventions or changes are are often disruptive, but really the numbers you're per you're showing with the work from Yasa are very hopeful with really large uh, potential reductions. Um, and also the role of the in the building sector. Um, and then this behavior change in the agent using the agent based models. For example, I'm very interested in climate change and cities. And this idea, I think, of the 15 minute city is like very transformational. And um, then through social changes like that can have a, a big uh, impact on the climate change uh, action uh, challenges that were that uh, the world is facing. So with that, let's turn to a sector um, uh, approach um, with uh, Jumin Mao, uh, who is Senior Water Specialist for the South Asia region at the World Bank. 
Um, her topic is Diving into Water, Climate, and Development, an analysis of water in the World Bank Country Climate and Development Report. So here's an example coming out of the, um, uh, the uh, climate and development reports that she Gia Lee um, introduced earlier. So, Jimun, over to you. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and then thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so my uh, uh, topic is related to what uh, Jia Lee was shared before. Um, because this uh, country climate development reports become such an important strategic document, and because water provides inputs for many of the sectors, and the climate change impacts largely manifest through the change of water cycle, the global water team thought it would be useful to do a analysis of the first batch of CCDR reports that's being produced and see what kind of insights we can get on you know, water sector activities from the climate change context. And the conclusion is that, first of all, um, the water is a very important catalyst um, for the economic growth, but also environment. Um, water is the most frequent uh, mentioned nexus analysis in all of the CCDRs. And uh, it has a lot of impacts because of its services inputs. For example, drought conditions in Malawi can increase the probability of an individual falling below the poverty line by 14%. And we also looked at what kind of climate change impacts will be showing through the change of water. By 2050, for example, in a dry or hot scenario, the Sahel region could see a five to 10% decline in crop revenue and an 11 to 20% con contraction in livestock yield. All this potential economic impact could wipe out annual growth in real GDP per capita in countries such as Burkina Faso and Niger. And also because of the change of water availability, um, the water scarcity is set to worsen where it already exists, for example, in Middle East countries and in the Sahel region, and it will affect regions where water is currently abundant, for example, in Central Africa and East Asia. And in the actions in water can, um, can also, sorry, reduce um, uh, greenhouse gas emission and build resilience. Um, uh, out of the 36 published CCDRs, which is the first batch, 27 of them recommended both adaptation or mitigation actions in the water sector. And if you look at the right-hand side of the picture, uh, contrasting with the other sectors, water is the only one that probably has more recommended action from the adaptation side. And then we also find out that 50% of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions from the wastewater sector can be abated with existing technology at zero negative costs. So there's a lot of potential to work in the water sector for both mitigation and adaptation. Um, we also looked at using text mining. Uh, we went through about 3000 pages of the CCDR reports published this far. And then we looked at what are the most frequently mentioned actions in the water sector. And we summarize here in this presentation, they are ranked by how often they are mentioned. You can see it's a mix of both infrastructure investments, nature-based solutions, as well as policy reforms. For example, the tariff reform required to making sure the value of water is correctly reflected uh, when, you know, in terms of usage. Um, so this is also what we found from the CCDR experiences where uh, across the globe, um, these are the key actions that will enable uh, adaptation. And we also find out that the water sector requires massive level of investments. The first group of CCDR estimated that um, annual water sector investments needs can be between 0.5 to 3% of GDP per year for the next decade. 
I also want to mention here that, you know, basically for countries to meet their mitigation and adaptation goals, there's a significant amount of investments are needed. Um, but the water sector alone is already quite um, challenging. And then at the end, we also want to look at, you know, what are the barriers in terms of translating all of these action, recommended action into um, real implementation um, on the ground. And we identify three groups of challenges. The first one is the large investment needs also imply an equally large financing gap, um, especially for countries that face huge adaptation needs. We need to help them find out you know, where those uh, investments could come from. The second, uh, as many of the colleagues already mentioned during this panel, the governance capacity constraints will limit the country's ability to integrate climate adaptation and mitigation and also water resources management into their development planning process. Um, and then lastly, there is a need to structure support for high value and low regret investments, but also crowding in multiple financing sources. And many countries need that kind of support to address this particular challenge. So this is a quick morning. summary of the um, first batch of CCDRs that we have uh, come up with um, and an analysis of the findings. Um, and then, you know, prioritization uh, of these kind of um, different policy recommendations would also um, require um, a lot of guidance from the scientific community, uh, not only helping understanding the challenges at hand, but also really looking at the feasibility of different solution space. So these are just some of the early findings we have come up with based on the first batch of CCDRs. Thank you. Thank you. Jimin, thank you very much um, for highlighting and going to, taking us to a specific sector, the water sector, and highlighting the linkages, of course, of water to poverty and food supply, um, and how it's not just water, how water is really the fundamental um, uh, impact area. Um, I think also scientifically, you made a very, into, I'm a climate scientist, so, um, you made a key point about the climate uh, when you um, said that the projections show that it's not only increasing scarcity in the in the regions that are scarce now, but that there are areas that are have adequate water or water abundance now, but that are projected uh, to also uh, become water scarce. And this is one of the reasons why the scenarios are absolutely critical uh, in in the planning um, uh, for. Uh, uh, for for water and all the sectors, um, you highlighted the uh, that the mitigation and adaptation actions are in some in some uh, some ways uh, separated, but also in some ways combined, and the need to look at that uh, mitigation and adaptation in a, a holistic way. I think that was um, another point that you made. And then finally, just the massive investments that you that you have identified through the CCDRs and the in, the uh, the um, analyses that they enable. Um, that uh, on, for example, the massive need for infrastructure, and then the challenges that go along with that in regard to both finance and also then uh, the governance. Um, and thanks very much for the for your last shout out of really bringing the science community um, uh, and working together with the policy community and the science community together as we address these um, these really truly massive countries, massive challenges in the low income countries. Well, that was our uh, wonderful set of uh, four panelists uh, talks that uh, talks from our four panelists. 
I'm going to ask one question now and then turn to first the folks in the room for questions um, um, who are there, right there. Um, and then we'll turn online to see if there's any comments or questions uh, from online. And then we'll see how our timing goes. I have other questions in reserve that I'm what uh, that I'll also share um, uh, if uh, if uh, if time allows. So um, this is the question that I'm going to ask. I had I, we had I had given them a heads up, but um, I, this is the one I'm selecting as the one that I'm going to ask, which is. What advice would you give to scientists as they seek to become more relevant to policymaking and policymakers? And what advice would you give to policymakers as they utilize as they utilize science-based evidence? All right. Kiwan, back to you. We're gonna we'll go in the same order and then then we'll then we'll mix it up. But let's go first back to Kiwan. Yeah, so so I think it's um, um, uh, generally probably the advice is 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 different depending on the on the level of governance that you one interacts with. So so I'm um, I'm actually part of the EU advisory board, but I'm also part of the advisory board of Vienna, uh, where we are um, at the moment, for example, um, helping the, the city to set up a new climate law. Um, in order to, um, uh, to 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 meet its uh, transformation transformational um, to meet its targets, yeah. So 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 I I I think the one the one advice that we repeated uh, multiple times to the Viennese city is um, to be less selective about um, the way that they digest science uh, to understand uh, at try to try to think in terms of different options rather than you know um, uh, numbers but at the end they need to decide for the number um, but um, but it's it, it has been uh, challenging a little bit for, for 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 us to communicate also uncertainties and that uh, planning at the policy level um, should more be for resilience rather than Concrete numbers and concrete numbers that, and targets, although difficult, more, more easy to implement at the end. So finding the right uh, uh, middle way of uh, making decisions that um, keep you uh, keep the flexibility in the political system is 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 um, and um, adaptivity uh, adaptation possibilities has been um, has has been a challenge uh, to to communicate sometimes. Um, and the second question was what 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 what, um, what advice to the to, to give to the scientists? I'm I'm not, I'm not so sure actually. In, in yeah, so to, to I think I think scientists very often. Um, so my understanding as a scientist is to try to uh, basically make transparent make the trade off surface. Uh, of different decisions transparent to science. So it's very, so to understand that we only provide the evidence that the decision maker needs to make a decision based on many, many different other priorities as well. And the better we scientists can uh, can um, make that, uh, that um, trade of service surface between different objectives transparent. And um, the, I think the better the decisions at the end will be. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Gia Lee. What would you, what advice would you give scientists and policymakers, and or policymakers? Uh, good question. Um, I would say uh, for scientists and researchers, um, I would call for many, many of you, like I kind of sit in between, um, to be involved and uh, to really get to you know, know the process of, um, you know, what country or decisions need to be made, what are the key concerns and how to work from there. Um, sometimes I, I think, you know, at the bank, we're doing more and more on climate change, but when I look around, we don't have many climate scientists. Um, and uh, so translational work from, you know, the research realm into application, and I think it's absolutely needed and it's really important. Some of these decisions may be really mundane. It's about 
building a road in Nepal, but you know it could have huge implications in the country's um, maybe physical space if the disasters you know wash off the roads over and over. Um, so that's one, and I think you know making that information accessible, simple, while still being able to communicate uncertainty. Um, I think that's also as much needed. Um, and I also agree with Karen's point about, you know, like this um, communication around trade-offs. Um, we know decision makers is not just one agent, like economists will always say, uh, but it's really multiple, you know, perspectives and concerns and being able to uh, get to that granularity, um, being able to, uh, you know, produce information that's useful. Um, I think that's also needed. It could be spatial, it could be social, economic um, uh, disaggregation, and other examples. Great, thank you. Uh, Shanali, is, do we still have Shanali? Thank you. Yeah, Cynthia, great question. Um, so I agree completely with all that's been said uh, by my colleagues here. Um, I mean, I think uh, both to scientists and policymakers, I kind of have a similar. Uh, answer uh, in terms of the question you posed. Uh, I mean, I think uh, among scientists, of course, disciplinary rigor is very important, but we're increasingly hearing, and I heard it several times during the last two days here, is that uh, we're more interested in looking at solutions to issues rather than sort of uh, how one discipline can contribute to that, addressing that issue, right? So there's a need for this interdisciplinarity in a sense and cross-disciplinary understanding and, and of addressing challenges um, in terms of what the specific challenge is rather than how a specific discipline uh, can contribute to understanding that. So among scientists, I would say, you know, be strong in the discipline that you're in, but uh, also talk to other disciplines and, and see how the disciplines can come together to solving a challenge. And amongst the policy realm, I think it's a similar message I have because traditionally there's been this kind of very siloed approach to addressing different sectoral issues. Uh, and I think there is an understanding even within the policy realm that yes, we need to cross cut across these silos, but at the same time, there's still a big gap in terms of how actual decision-making takes place. So I, I hope that there can be more sort of uh, cross-sector, cross-program uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, understanding and dialogue to really address big challenges. Thank you. Thank you. And Shumin, what would you say in your terms Thank of your you advice? So um, so for the scientist community, I think my advice is to really think about your modeling, for example, process. How can you reflect more of the reality in terms of implementation? Because at this stage, we spent, I think we have better, uh, we, we spent a lot of effort on understanding what are the future uh, challenges but we still have a lot to do in terms of solutions. And oftentimes the current modeling uh, efforts does not necessarily reflect the nuances of the implementation. For example, you know, when we're estimating the solutions or impacts of climate change through the water, the model sometimes assumes the transfer of water from one sector to another or from one region to another in response to scarcity is accomplished at little cost to the economy, and which you know um, would be much better if that kind of nuances can be reflected. And then I think it will gain a lot of credibility to policymakers. And for the suggestion to policymakers or decision makers, I think to better utilize the models and the modeling results, um, I agree with the other colleagues, they really need to think about how do you coordinate? Because we oftentimes talk about, you know, wing, wing, wing solutions, but in reality, none of this will be achieved if the sector ministries don't, doesn't talk to each other. What we need at the moment is probably a combination of very strong and science-based central planning 
but with decentralized decision-making that responds to local contexts and challenges. And this really requires at the central level, the, the ministries understands, you know, that all of these trade-offs and then resources needs to be discussed and understood together, not in a siloed manner. So that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for those very thoughtful answers. I think each each one of you address this, where we are now, which is how, the challenges of, as I said at the beginning, the urgency of climate change action. And that we are now in it, desperate need of the solutions and the implementation of solutions. And that on for both the scientist side and the policy maker side, that there needs to be um, the flexibility, the communication um, and the de siloization so that the coordination can really occur both across the, those big, um, those, those big, um, Science, science policy divides, but also within each of those as well, um, so that um, uh, s s in this new phase, really of where we are now in terms of climate action, that this is what what's really needed. So thank you very much for that very wise uh, counsel and advice. Now, I believe we have some uh, questions in the chat and uh, let me see. Um, the first one is, uh, from Hime Huchuhio. Um, oh, will the presentations shared by the panelists be available for the attendees? Um, Sophia, can you answer that question, please? I'm actually going to ask Rania to answer that question. Okay. Um, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. Yep, we okay. have permissions from all speakers, as far as I understand it. So I'm not sure how the organizers plan to share, but I suspect by linking on the web page, uh, we can get we can get back to the person who is interested in this. Great. All right, we have. Um, I think it's one main question. Um, I'm going to read it out, um, and um, then whoever wants to jump in of the panelists. Um, how to, this is from George Cummings. Um, how to start advice for World Bank outcome bonds, CO2 sequestration, endorsed UNESCO coastal protection product for people's lives and property, new marine habitats. Um, let's see, let me just see. I'm looking to. Um, Looking to, I'm reading over the question, see if I can summarize it. Um, um, let's see, I think it's, I think we can ask um, uh, whoever would like to jump in, either from the YASA side or the World Bank side, um, what um, uh, are there specific uh, interventions, investments, or in, um, investment um, strategies or programs uh, related to, in particular, coastal protection. I think this is a sector we didn't cover, but this is a very, very key uh, sector. So maybe we're in the, maybe we could ask um, um, uh, Gia Lee in the uh, CCDRs, um, were the coastal, the, the uh, countries with coastal vulnerabilities, how were they handled? And is that a source for some of, I think, the responses to this um, to this uh, gentleman's question? Yeah, thank you. Maybe a quick uh, response is, um, yes, uh, at the bank, there's a large group, and actually different groups, really working on finance questions, and particularly around climate finance. And so far, more progress has been done around mitigation, carbon markets, and um, you know activities and innovative financing mechanisms to support mitigation. And adaptation resilience is very much a nascent, uh, but emerging topic, a lot of interest, a lot of recognition. So we have different financing uh, approaches for doing this, um, some at the city level, and uh, some at the sectoral level. And um, so they do encompass different types of engagement. Sometimes it's you know, supporting countries with their planning uh, and also uh, resilient infrastructure. And more 
specifically around adaptation, there are some examples, but um, I, I don't think this is necessarily, you know, in the CCDR, which is more forward looking, uh, but happy to provide more information. Wonderful, thank you. And yes, uh, this gentleman has uh, put his email um, um, and uh, perhaps uh, Rania and you know, we can we can hook up um, with the YASA committee as well. Thank you for that. All right, we have, we're very congratulations to all speakers and uh, participants because we're in very good time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn to each one of our speakers again for a final word, a final thought. Um, and I know you've you've each given some advice, um, but I just want to cycle back to you all very briefly for a brief take home point, given the growing urgency for climate action, what is most crucially needed now to advance science policy linkages? So the kind of distillation of your advice. Um, uh, that you gave um, uh, a bit a bit longer um, responses to. What's what's your or what's your final thought at at the end of this session? Kiwan, over to you. <laughs> Back to you. And, and Cynthia, I apologize for interrupting. Uh, Sophia tells me that there are some questions in the room as well. I know that this oh. uh, hybrid format is not ideal. Oh, 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 good, you, good, 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 good. I see. Very good. Sorry. Let's go to let's turn to those then. Um, please. Sophia, help us, please, with uh, who has a question. So please identify I'll... yourself. Hopefully this is working. Can you hear me? Yes. So this is Pam McAwee. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm at Rutgers University, but I also do a lot of work um, with IBES. So that's the biodiversity equivalent of the IPCC. And we're doing a big assessment report right now um, that cuts across biodiversity, climate, food, water, and health. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about um, in these processes is we hear so much, and we've heard it a lot at this workshop as well, about the need to sort of move away from the linear model of science advice, where like we produce a model and we just sort of hand it off to the policymakers and hope that they're going to make the right decisions. Um, and much more, thinking much more about co-production, right? It's kind of a buzzword, but I do think it's important mm -hmm. um, sort of bringing in policymakers in the production of some of these outputs as well. So I wanted to ask um, any of the speakers or all of the speakers, um, in terms of processes, are there like best practices that either you've been involved with um, or you know about, and maybe Cynthia, some of the work you've done in New York City fits this, mm -hmm. where it's it really is a, a, a work in progress where policymakers and scientists really are um, going back and forth and developing things together, whether it's models, whether it's um, community engagement around inputs to models. Um, I just, I would love to have some, some sort of examples of best practices on the process itself, because I feel like that doesn't get enough attention. Wonderful, great. So let's use this as our last question. Um, would one or more of the panel members like to take it on? Uh, I would. I would be happy first? to start. But okay. Um, key one, and then I think someone spoke up from the panel, and then I'll take say a very few words at the end too. For I'll do. I'm going to do a quick re recap. I can also say uh, something. But all right, very quickly then. Very good. Kiwan first. Yeah, so so I think uh, I think this is a really um, uh, crucial question. It's also, I think, um, how important it is, uh, you see actually at the current uh, uh, international climate policy uh, dialogue, uh, the, for example, that the, the IPCC has been criticized quite a lot to um, to have missed important dimension of justice and equity uh, in its analysis. And some of the developing countries uh, feel that uh, they were not involved uh, enough in some of the research questions and the way that the research questions have been addressed. And so I think um, absolutely critical for, um, uh, for also building up trust and legitimacy of the final scientific product is particularly in areas where 
Um, there's not a very, there's not a, just one answer to it, but uh, some of the answers are based on uh, normative questions and subjective perceptions of um, who has to contribute how much to a global common problem. I think it's important to have this, to have the decision makers directly involved in the in the design. Uh, in the design of the study. There are many uh, different um, uh, good examples, particularly I would say in, in, in Jimin's area of energy, water, land, nexus studies, they are very often uh, cross boundary because basins go across boundaries. So you would do what you need to do is you need to get the main decision makers involved from um, different, uh, different countries. We had a big study in the Indus um, in the Indus basin between Pakistan and India that is a water treaty between those countries, very difficult even to discuss about this. The scientists and the policymakers did not want to meet in one of the countries, so we met in Nepal and, and uh, it, it did had actually a, a fantastic um, uh, build um, a fantastic in, initial had a fantastic initial discussion for a scenario design, which was then um, uh, really taken serious by the local local governments. So I don't think there is one this one cooking cooking recipe, other than that you need to build up trust and communicate with the with the, with the decision makers ahead of time and and try to uh, marry different viewpoints and get, take them into account in your study design. Um, I think we're just about out of time. I'm suggesting that the people who are in the room can follow up um, with Pam on this question. Uh, Jumin, do you want to just say a, like three, you know, one minute answer, and then I want to say something at the end. Sure, I'll just mention really quickly, you know, for, for example, the CCDR process itself, every single one of the report is co almost co-produced with inputs from the, the country government. So a lot of this modeling assumptions and inputs data were directly uh, you know, received from the government. So I think in a way there's a lot of process already happening where the demand and then the, the ownership is critical because we all know unless they have inputs in that process, the implementation will not happen, right? We cannot force it onto, onto them. So just want to mention that. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Well, I okay, very, very quickly, I just, one best practice from New York City is that leadership is still very, very important. I'm going to give one brief anecdote that when we started the New York City Panel on Climate Change in 2007, it was uh, started by Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and he he brought all the commissioners together across all the agencies. And he basically said, we are now gonna take up and now co-create with the scientists on the New York City Panel on Climate Change, the, the planning for New York, the resilience of New York City. And then from that leadership at the top, then the hall of we all the scientists and the folks that were the, the, at the working levels of the agencies all got together. But that leadership from the top to say, yes, we are not going to work in silos. We are going to uh, co-create this together. And, and NPCC4, that was NPCC1 and NPCC4. As was uh, just look at it on the web. The reports coming out are just so so beautiful. To, it's a beautiful example of the co-created process. So Pam, thanks for asking that question. I want to thank all the speakers um, and of course the academies for hosting the conference and the session. Thank you, speakers, for really thoughtful, um, important um, presentations and um, and really sharing your uh, words of wisdom from this great experience that that you all have. And uh, thanks also Rania from at the and the U.S. Committee on Yasa who um, who did the heavy lifting on organizing. Thanks so much. I wish I could be there. Um, and uh, um, and uh, to be continued. Thanks so much. Bye.